It's Remembrance Sunday today, and very somber day on, on the calendar. For a couple of reasons, I wanted to make a video. A couple of months ago, there was a protest in London, and I saw some footage of a young guy uh, who climbed up on the cenotaph and tried to burn uh, the Union Jack on the cenotaph, uh, quite unsuccessfully actually. And then a few other protesters uh, spray painted the bottom of it. And, you know, I look at um, an event like that, not with, you know, aghast or uh, anger or anything like that at all. No, um, interestingly, I saw this, it, it's sort of a sense of pity I have uh, in that moment. Because, you know, I, it stayed with me a bit and I was thinking about it. It's not the first thing in my mind for the last couple of months at all. But considering it's Remembrance Sunday, I thought I'd... Remembrance Sunday, this thought process is interesting, I think. It dwelled on my mind for months and it struck me that young man who was up there and perhaps the people around him, didn't know what that structure was. They didn't know it at all. They had no idea, they didn't even know probably what it was name was, they probably didn't even read the text on it. They saw something else in their mind, uh, a symbol to them. They were sort of projecting. And, you know, it's absolutely fine. Um, and and this, this, this thing which struck me was that no one has taught them, no one has said to them what this means, because if they had known what the cenotaph stands for, then I am pretty certain, I am almost 100% certain, they would not have climbed up on there, they would not have uh, assaulted it in, 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 in any way. Because the, the, the cenotaph is not a, a political statement, it's a tomb. It's an empty tomb. A tomb Potentially, I suppose you could say, can be a political statement, but not this one. There is a cenotaph in cities and towns and all over the world, in many different countries, and in different cultures, where there is enmity between different people. They, we, we all have places to honour the dead, honour those who fought and lost their lives, the unknown soldier. I think that was it. If the young man and the people around him had just known what it stood for, they would not have tried to desecrate it or, um, and therefore offending people in the country. And that, that's part of the reason I wanted to do this video, because about a month ago, so I'll give a bit of groundwork, um, I've been doing on my little YouTube channel, uploading video chapter by chapter of this book, The Gentle Art of Tramping. This book, which um, my dear friend Jacob said I must read. This is after I'd walked across France. I didn't read it before I set out on any of my little adventures. Thank, thank you to Jacob, a grâce de Jacob. I have been introduced to this most brilliant writer. I won't get much into this, but the author, Stephen Graham, I, I've loved his prose so much, his, his style of writing. I started researching his other works and I've, I'm, going to slowly accumulate his books and they're quite hard to find because um, the only one that's in print at the moment is that book. All the others are out of print. So I've got two more books from him. I've got this one called The Challenge of the Dead and I have this one also, A Private in the Guards. This one was written I think in 1919 and this one was written in 19... Or, or 1920. Stephen Graham, who was Stephen Graham? A quick thing about him. He was a journalist writer type fellow, but at the beginning of the First World War, he was out in Russia. He'd spent a lot of time in Russia. He'd learned Russian. And when that happened, he saw the war up until 1917 um, on the Eastern Front. He'd seen the First World War, the, the brutality of it on the Eastern Front. And then obviously there was the revolution in Russia, Russia at which point he returned to uh, England and enlisted in the army. Now he could have been an officer, but he chose specifically to be a private in the guards. There was no rod up his backside or anything like this. He, he, this, this chap 
had no prejudice or what whatsoever. He was a sort of humanist guy and he wanted to be in the trenches with the good, as I think as he says, the good working men of his country. So a very brave man and he actually fought in the war in um, 1918 in the great offences that went on there and eventually to the overturning of Germany's gains, the Prussian gains on the Western Front. And I came across this book, which the challenge of the dead. I went straight to the back and I, ca I, went, I, went, I came across the epilogue. I read the epilogue and, and it's almost like the penny dropped for me. I was instantly moved. A sense of clarity came into my mind because in this epilogue, it is all about, well, not all, but it is about the cenotaph. And it is about the underpinning, the, the why and, and how um, it came about and the, and the sentiments behind it. And, and so, I mean, I've read this whole book now, but I started reading the epilogue and I read the whole book. And perhaps in the future, I, I want to do a, try and make an audio book of it, but who knows. And this book, it's a travel book. In 1920, he goes back to the Western Front and he walks along the, the battle line, the trenches as they are after the war. He describes what he sees, what's happening, and he jumps from the place, whether it's Yeeps or whether it is Ostend, you know, and he, he, he describes the desolation during the war, the horrors, stories, anecdotes he'd heard, he'd experienced, and then describes what it is like two years later, the battlefield. Um, covered, um, still pitted with craters, Far farmers coming back and slowly reclaiming land that was for four years a battlefield, soldiers continually digging up, still two years later and still going on after this book is finished, uh, still going on to today, digging up soldiers who had perished on the field and been buried in uh, under the ground because of bombs, shells or mud sinking into the mud. And it's, it's a very sombre, moving book. Horrifying, eye-opening, makes one understand a lot better. And it's also, it's also quite a treat because we talk, we talk about the war, during the war, but we don't often, well, we forget what happened just after the war. What happened to the trenches just after the war? I suppose many people haven't even thought about that. So this gives a good insight, you know. Everything from, you know, the the parentless children, the children of war, the corruption of the area as well as the corruption of the people. It, it is a beautiful book. And that is why I want to, going back to this, this point of these young people uh, not knowing what they're doing when they attack a place like the Cenotaph, is to this final chapter, which gives you the understanding of what is there and what it means. And in 1920, the cenotaph was being built and it was to be unveiled two years after the end of the war uh, on November the 11th on Armistice Day. And on, on that same day, that same procession, uh, an unknown soldier, a random Tom, Dick or Harry, as he says in this book, is brought from France past the cenotaph of the glorious dead and buried in Westminster Abbey amongst the kings, amongst the poets. It is in recognition of that, uh, that dead soldier, that, that effect of war, which is important. It's, it's not political. But anyway, I'm going to now share with you some passages from that epilogue. In a separate video, I have recorded the entire epilogue, which is about 20 minutes long. I suggest go, go, go watch the whole thing because he starts off in, on a train coming across the front, going to Paris and arriving in Paris and seeing the celebrations taking place by the Arc de Triomphe for them, their unknown soldiers being buried at the Arc de Triomphe. 
and uh, this sort of gaiety, this this celebration, this pomp, the flags, uh, the excitement is beautifully contrasted with the at that same moment midnight in Paris, miles, dozens of miles away, where there are no street lights, just pastures and fields. There lie at that time the dead still cold on the battlefield even two years later and then he goes to London across the channel back home to the British burying their dead their unknown in London so it's beautiful so I just jump to that and then you can get a bit of that information In those strange fields covered with darkness, at this midnight hour, unilluminated lie the silent ones, crosses without end, the signs of life laid down. France will not forget them, and we shall not forget. So let us leave this gaiety behind and take the midnight train for Calais, for Dover, for London, for the Cenotaph, the Abbey, for new life. It is a full train and pulls out soberly from the gay city and bears onward, onward to the little channel and the waiting boat which ere the dawn shall face the wonderful white cliffs of Albion and home. The most enduring moment of Armistice Day will be the silence at eleven, the moment of communion. Only the end of a small war can express itself in noise, the end of such and one, as this in Europe, was silence. And a fitting monument of silence is the cenotaph, the empty tomb, the impersonal cenotaph, without any cross or weeping Christ or rampant lions, without even the pronoun our, which some wish to see upon it, our glorious dead, instead of the glorious dead can stand for all who laid down their lives, baptised or unbaptised, white or coloured, friend or foe. For even Germans had to die that Europe might be free. So in leaving the fields of the dead and the beginning and the end of the war and Paris itself, you come naturally to the cenotaph, the stone which gathers to itself all the experience and all that was shared and sacred in the war. The altar at the summit of a thousand weary steps. It stands in the midst of England's great street of government, twixt Nelson and the Abbey, and says to all who pass, go and do thou likewise. To all the selfish, we were not selfish. To the clamorous, we are silent, yet we speak. To the strident and ambitious, to the self-seekers and the cynical, to those who live as though there has been no sacrifice, to those who sneer at the ideal. We suffered and died that you might have your life, that all might have more life. We suffered and died for the good of the whole. France's ideal is that through the sacrifice of her sons, France should become greater yet. Our men did not die that England might become greater but that Europe might be saved from tyranny and greed. And it is for us and our public men to see that their sacrifice shall never seem to grow barren. It will grow barren unless we who now live are ready to continue the sacrifice. No good comes into the world but after struggle and pain. No new life comes but through death. No common weal is gained without giving and serving. Our common life must have a foundation of human hearts, ready to give, ready to live, for England and for us all. It hath been said, he liveth best who is always ready to die. It can be put in a new way. He liveth best who is always ready to put all upon the altar. Humanity is well served when nations are ready to sacrifice themselves for her good. She is worse served by the nations who still preserve the tribal instinct to fight and destroy their neighbours. She is worse served by the nations who are enslaving other nations. 
and that nation is most alive which has most people ready to sacrifice themselves and their estate. That nation liveth worse, which contains the most selfish. Of Christ it was written, he saved others, himself he could not save. But the selfish man saves himself first, and then thinks of others. The selfish man is quarrelsome, and runs easily to law. He enacts guarantees, he counts his costs, he heavily insures. He holds what he does not want, and is afraid of another getting it. That nation liveth best whose men and women are freest for an adventure, but worst whose men and women are most cautious. He is most happy who has run to the altar and surrendered his all there to God, and then found a will and a way in which to live. For most, alas, there is no altar visible, no way to an altar. They do not know what the altar is, nor what it is for. Business and war and hate and selfish desire have hidden it from men's eyes. Only when the cloud lifts the altar is disclosed, and men commonly when they see it leave all that they have and run to it and fling themselves before it in tears. It is the grand altar of humanity, the altar of all on which the one sacrifices himself. It is the altar of the sacrifice of Christ, the cross. The quartering of humanity, an altar in the midst of the people. All education and literature and religious mission should be to one end, that the way to the altar may be kept clear. It is work to clear away all the obstructions and the fogs and the mists. Sweet singing, pious exhortation, the reading of books, love of the dim religious light of churches. These should not be ends in themselves. Humanity has its pious part which goes to church, but it does not need the organization of the pious. Humanity has its charitable part, but it does not need the organization of the charitable. Humanity has its cultures, but it does not stand in need of schools or forts and cults and intelligentsia. But humanity does need sacrifice upon one great altar every day and all days. The cenotaph rising in our midst may be our altar. We may leave our flowers there, the incense smoke of burning hearts, but the flowers should be our lives. The cenotaph, after all, is only the visible sign of the great invisible cenotaph of humanity, which stands in the midst of the ages, an empty tomb in memory of all those who have gone before, of those whose sacrifice without ours is not perfect. At Westminster Abbey, they have buried the dead soldier among poets and statesmen. They have dug up from France, Tom, Dick or Harry, one of us, unnamed, unknown, who laughed and talked and marched and fired and suffered in the war. One of the many who are always unknown. He did guard duty, no doubt, in France. He is put on sentry again. Touching as it is to have a soldier in the dim light of the abbey, where so many can shed invisible tears. It had been better, perhaps, in a stern era, to have posted him at St. Stephen's, at the entry to Parliament, that he might challenge in his silence all who enter there to stand for England. Who goes there? Friend. Advance and be recognised. Pass. Friend. Proceed at your peril, if you cannot meet the challenge of the dead. So obviously one of the great themes at, towards the end of this epilogue is, is the theme of sacrifice, uh, very much portrayed in his um, mentioning of Christ and his talk of uh, this great love of one to sacrifice oneself for a higher ideal. You know, when... when when I look at that, and I think when most people look at that and know what it is, they do think of sacrifice. And they wonder, what would I sacrifice? Would I be like that soldier, that Tom, Dick or Harry, and do the same as they? Or would I 
protect myself, run away from danger, quarrel, um, strife, difficulty. What do I value? Do I value my material things? Or do I value freedom? And it seemed very much... Today we have... We're surrounded by new narratives. New historians, pundits, um, hearsay, old wise tale. Just different ideas about what the war meant, why it happened. And you hear quite often today that it was a pointless war. That it didn't... It should never happen. England should never, never have joined in the war. And that may well be true, this opinion. Uh, it may be more correct. When you read this account, two years just after the war, of a, a soldier who himself fought in the war, uh, who visiting the battlefield after the war, and then going to Paris, the Arc de Triomphe, and then going to London where the cenotaph is. You realise they did believe they were fighting for something. You, they, you know, they talk about Prussian militarism, Prussian tyranny, you know, all the same sentiments which we prescribe to the Second World War are sort of existing here. And so, you know, he 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 makes a He's crying. He's almost crying out in here. He's almost crying out, saying, "Please let this death be justified. Please let this sacrifice be justified. Our sacrifice on the altar is worth it. This you can feel it. I mean, I can feel it when I'm reading this. And I think that is one of the main themes." or ideas around the cenotaph, is that here we, here lies a soldier, or the unknown dead, the glorious dead. And every year, we come back to look at it, to lay a wreath, to recite a poem, and to think, and to have a two-minute silence, to try and just think why. And it's because of this this sentiment that this is the last dead family, this is the last sacrifice, and after that there is hope, there is, you know, bright sunlit uplands, and and we can move into a, a new glorious world, and that's that's the hope in the cenotaph, as well as remembering the dead, is that perhaps the dead are calling to us and saying, remember us so that we may be the last to be remembered. Remember us so that we may be the last to be remembered. Maybe that is one of the most important aspects of it. Um, and certainly when I, when I think about it now, that is what I think. I, I hope um, for a growing peace and that the, the strife of man around in war and in feuds and whatnot diminishes over time and I think it's important that we do remember because then that assists that urge that want for peace and prosperity and towards a better world so lest we forget one thing to end on, I did learn recently in Flanders Fields by John McCree. In Flanders Fields the poppies blow, between the crosses row on row. There is our grave, and in the sky, the birds still bravely singing fly, scarce heard amid the guns below. We are the dead short days ago. We lived, felt dawn, felt sunset glow, loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders' fields. Take up our quarrel with the foe, to you with failing arms we throw, the torch, be it yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with us who die, 
We shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders fields.